today's clip is another one that does need a little bit of a setup before I just throw you in there. Richard Dawkins and I were talking about the RNA world hypothesis. The idea that RNA, or something like RNA, was the first replicator to come into existence. RNA is really cool because it acts as an enzyme and as a template for its own replication. This means that not only could it act as a gene early on, but it could also be a functional molecule that could participate. It could participate in chemical reactions in the environment that would help it survive and replicate. To be clear, most origin of life researchers do not think that a pure RNA world existed. What I mean by that is that they don't think that it was actually RNA as we know it today that was just replicating and evolving on the early Earth. The origin of life was likely far more messy than this. But Sol Spiegelman was a researcher who started doing some really cool experiments with chains of RNA. In vitro evolution. Evolution in the test tube with chains of RNA. One of the things that his experiments produced is a chain of RNA called Spiegelman's Monster. Here's Professor Dawkins to tell you all about it. Spiegelman had a, a virus called Q-beta, an RNA virus. Um, so its genes are entirely made of RNA, and it needs an enzyme in order to replicate its RNA, and this is called uh, Q-beta replicase. Yes, I'm going to read a paragraph from the ancestor's tale here. Spiegelman did something wondrous. He set a form of evolution in motion in this wholly artificial test tube world with no cells involved at all. Imagine his setup as a long row of test tubes, each containing Q-beta replicase, that's the enzyme, and raw building blocks, but no RNA, no RNA at all. He seeded the first tube with small amounts of Q-beta RNA, and it duly replicated lots more copies of itself. He then drew out a small sample of the liquid and put a drop of it in the second tube. They've got a whole lot of it tubes, one after another, representing generations. When this had been going on for a while, Spiegelman drew out a drop from the second tube and seeded the third virgin tube and so on. Spiegelman sampled the RNA in his tubes as the generations, as generations of tubes went by and monitored its properties, including its potency in infecting bacteria. That these, this, this um, virus is, is a phage, which means it's a parasite of bacteria. So it, it needs to infect bacteria. And what he found was fascinating. The evolving RNA became physically smaller and smaller, and at the same time, less and less infective when bacteria were offered. It didn't need to infect bacteria because it was doing it all in the test tube. It was provided with the necessary um, way to live in the test tube. After 74 generations, 74 tube generations, the typical RNA molecule in the tube had evolved to a small fraction of the size of its wild ancestor. What was even more remarkable is he, if he did the experiment several times, he always converged upon the same uh, RNA, which, which was called Spiegelman's monster or Spiegelman's right. mini, mini variant. And then later, some German workers did a similar experiment, which was even more remarkable. Under some conditions, a test tube containing no RNA at all, just the raw material for making RNA, plus the Q-beta replicase enzyme, can spontaneously generate self-replicating RNA, which under the right circumstances will evolve to become similar to Spiegelman's monster. So here we have a beautiful example of convergent evolution in a test tube, starting from not quite nothing, but something very close to nothing. Right. Certainly there's absolutely no creator involved there. Some people might think, oh, well, the RNA got smaller and it got simpler. Um, that's not really all that interesting. What actually happened is that the, the sequence evolved and adapted to its new environment. Its new environment had different requirements than its environment when it was, you know, part of the genome of a virus. And it adapted specifically to those requirements. It optimized, it, it optimized for its own replication. And there's a wonderful paper by Gerald Joyce called 40 Years of In Vitro Evolution, and it's free online. Everyone should read this, it's amazing. But he goes over a bunch of follow-up experiments. They threw different problems, different challenges at these evolving chains of RNA, and they would, they would increase in complexity quite dramatically to accomplish all sorts of things. There's even a medication that was evolved. It was an evolved chain of RNA that's used as medicine uh, for, for years. It, it, would, uh, it prevents the onset 
of blindness and aging. We now have a, a I think it's an antibody version of the same drug that's easier to store and so it's cheaper. Uh, so, so the RNA one is no, is no longer being used, but RNAs, I mean, it's evolving chains of RNA. It's, it, it can, they can solve real problems. Meaningful information emerges simply as a consequence of replication, replication with mutations plus selection. It is very amazing and it, and it completely gives the lie to anybody who thinks you have to have a creator uh, to, to start these things off. And it, it really does show what an increase in complexity, increase in adaptive efficiency as the generations go by. So that was just a clip from my conversation with Richard Dawkins. You can see the whole thing. There's a link to that down below. Subscribe to this channel if you enjoyed it. I upload clips pretty regularly, talks and conversations and presentations that I've done on genetics and evolution. And I am gearing up to start doing weekly videos again here that are completely new, completely fresh.